Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, but before I introduce this week's guest, uh, just a, a note about a couple of locals events coming up uh, this coming week on Wednesday, the 17th of April. There are two happening. Uh, one is in Carlisle and the other is in Beaconsfield, uh, very far apart, uh, but they are united in both being New Culture Forum, locals events, totally free. Uh, if you are in either of those areas and you'd like to come along, uh, these events are proving so popular, um, then we would love to see you. The uh, best thing to do to get details is to go to this email, write to this email, which is locals at newcultureforum.org.uk. It'll also be down here in uh, the blurb underneath this video. Um, anyway, so that's Wednesday, 17th of April, this coming Wednesday, um, and uh, both of them are in the evening. Okay, so maybe see you there. Um, now, my guest this week, well, you already know her really quite well because she's always on, a th I'm very pleased to say, our show Newspeak, so she was on yesterday with us. Uh, Amy Gallagher, though, um, is also standing as the uh, SDP candidate for the London mayoralty, and uh, she's here talking to me. Now, Amy, um, does this include the London Assembly as well? Yes, yeah. So you were on this list thing, are yeah, you? Number yeah. one, are you on Yeah, that? number one. We've, number got, we've, we've entered 11 candidates, I think, but I'm, I'm the top one, yeah. Now, yeah. you know, I remember I've spoken to Lawrence when he said he was going to stand, and also we've had reformed people on. But um, tell me, why did you want to stand for the military? <laughs> Well, I mean, I like. I was always drawn to the SDP because just because their policies matched mostly with my own than any other party. Um, and essentially, well, they approached me and asked me if I would do it. And I initially just thought that's completely insane and crazy. <laughs> I'd never imagined that I could be involved in politics in that way. Um, but then I just, I just went away and I thought about it. And I thought about kind of London and what it means to me. And it seemed, you know, I feel like a very unlikely kind of politician, but. Um, I felt actually, I felt like I wanted to do something. I feel like obviously with my legal case, um, you know, it's a very stressful, difficult thing to go through. And I've always said, you know, it shouldn't be down to ordinary people to make changes via lawfare. It should be politicians and political parties that stand up to this thing. So I felt that it was for me to do something in that area as well. You mentioned that your legal case, of mm -hmm. course, that's how we first met. Yes, actually. yeah, uh, over a year you ago. You were on this uh, programme. Mm -hmm. Is it two years ago now or a year ago? A year and a bit. A year Talking, can you just briefly tell us, of course, you are in the middle of an action with the uh, NHS, are you not? Yeah, with the Tavistock um, NHS Trust. Um, so essentially, yeah, I was training to be a psychotherapist in my kind of final year and I was kind of bullied and hounded out for disagreeing with critical race theory, essentially. So ideas of white privilege, ideas of all white people are racist. And as soon as I sort of spoke out about that, I was a sort of essentially a marked woman and I went through over a year of sort of bullying and being told that I was inappropriate, being told that I was unsafe and so on and eventually I was stopped from finishing my clinical work with patients. So yeah, I'm kind of almost, it's, it's difficult to know with a legal case, it's a bit like how long is a piece of string, but I'm, we're getting there and it's yeah. still ongoing. Yeah. 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 And uh, of course, you did a great program for us all about what's happened with therapy, oh, yes. the heresies, yeah. which is, well, actually, when I last looked, it's, it's on 200,000 views. Yeah, I, I'm amazed. I'm very proud of it, actually. Yeah. And um, yeah, thank you to NCF no, for allowing me. Excellent, <laughs> excellent documentary. Yeah. But anyway, back to the harsh realities of electoral politics. Yeah. You thinking you said a lot about London. Mm -hmm. You are a Londoner, are you? Yes, yeah. What is it? I mean, tell us a bit about, you know, where you grew up? I've always grown so I've grown up always in kind of South London areas. So I think I was born in I was born in New Cross and I've always lived sort of in sort of Catford, Lewisham area, um, I lived in Bromley and now I live sort of in I live in Alpington in well it's just slightly outside of the in Bromley area. But all my family have lived in London. So my, my grandparents have lived in London. Um, my dad was a, a London taxi driver, so London's very much, a, <laughs> yeah, part of our kind of what I, you know, part of my identity really. Um, I've never lived anywhere else, um, and my dad was always very proud to be a, a London taxi driver. He always spoke very highly of London, you know, driving tourists around and how how great our city is. 
Um, and yeah, I mean, I've seen it change as most of us have, as, as you say in your documentary, that in the last, I, I guess, what would we say, five, ten years. Mm -hmm. I mean, these changes have been happening for longer than that. Um, but I think that the dramatic change has probably happened in the last five or ten years. And I just feel very sad. Mm. I feel very sad to see that change and to feel almost like I don't want to live here anymore and think of where, where else would I live, which um, I'd never thought I'd, I would feel. So, yeah, I do feel that there needs to be somebody speaking up about what some of us are experiencing. That we're some of I, I would say I think a lot of us are kind of grieving for a city that, as as you say, has been lost. Um, and yeah, I feel like we need to make our voice, voices heard. I and mean, when you say how, you know, what has been lost or mm. the changes, you know, if you had to say like, give us three or four points, what would you say the most important ones? I, it, it's a combination of things. I think London's took an absolute battering in all sorts of ways. I think um, COVID, the pandemic, uh, had a. I don't think London's fully recovered from mm. that in terms of its nightlife, in terms of its energy, in terms of its buzz. I think mass immigration has dramatically changed London. Um, it's, I mean, London's more affected by mass, arguably more affected by mass immigration than any other city in, in England, really. Um, and we've seen so much change culturally. And because of that, I, I think it goes hand in hand with crime, you know, so London feels far less safe to me than it ever has. So I've been working as a nurse in London for 10 years now. When I look back at some of the jobs I used to do, the kind of the shift work where I'd get up very early and travel in the dark in winter and travel home at night in the, you know, when it was dark and some of the places I traveled through, I just, there's absolutely no way I'd do that now. Mm. I just think I can't believe I did that, you know, but I felt safer then, I guess, that that was the issue. And it feels, to me, London just feels so hostile. It feels, public transports are very unpleasant now um, and I just think it's um, there's just so many things you know there's so many restrictions on freedom as well it's you know the train strikes ULEs LTNs everything you just think gosh this is so difficult now and it London always felt to me the place of opportunity and hope and kind of freedom mm -hmm. and excitement and now it just feels like you know you're just seeing all the problems everywhere and I've, I've lost that feeling of um, yeah, excitement, I guess, about London. I mean, do you, do you use London a lot? I, or do you tend to stick to where you are, say, like in Orpington? Mm, yeah, well, I'm less, I use London less now. Um, I, I'm, my work is now closer to where I live, so I'm not travelling into central London so much. Um, I'm more careful with the areas I travel through. Um, I still love London. There's still wonderful parts of it. Um, but you do feel, even when you, you're in the wonderful, you know, being here in Westminster, it's, you know, you still feel inspired by walking past Parliament and seeing the National Gallery. I still feel inspired by, by those places. But you do, it always comes with a, a sense of, but we might, we're losing this. We're losing something great here. And I think, you know, particularly in the last six months or so, with, you know, just protests after protests after protests, um, and all of this, you know, divisive rhetoric and extremism it's not you know it just doesn't feel like how it used to mm, that mm. that's how i feel i mean obviously you have to put your policies forward don't mm -hmm. you i mean we're talking about may the second by the way yeah. aren't we the actual election and on may the second you've got the mayoralty and the london assembly mm. elections um when it comes to you say you talk about feeling unsafe mm. right so and this massive knife crime we have now. Um, this current mayor has been an abject failure on it. What would you do? What are you putting forward to, to somehow deal with that? So within policing, I mean, what, what's been most concerning, I think more recently, is, is the two-tier policing that we've been seeing, that the police aren't neutral anymore. I think a lot of us feel that police are completely captured we see them you know, celebrating and getting involved with some protests and being very heavy handed with other protests. I think it's too far. It, it, it makes them look unfair, but it also makes them look unprofessional and, and people just don't trust them. So we would I mean, we, we, def, we, we want to defund all the diversity inclusion industry from the mayor and from public transport. That's just get yeah, rid of it. Just get rid of it. <clears throat> it's so much money goes on it. And Sadiq Khan always spending millions on this stuff you know we saw recently all the the changing of the names of the 
the train lines cost six million just to call it the suffragette line that you know that stuff I think is really winding people up but within the police we're seeing uh, lo lots of money being spent on the sending off the police to kind of diversity training and all of this sort of stuff so we'd we'd want to just cut that save money but we'd also want to implement a kind of uh, return to neutrality within the police um, and then alongside that we want to we want to try out some kind of zero tolerance approaches to policing I mean as you say knife crimes it's just appalling at the moment. We want to get political correctness out of the police. So we would like to, well, I'd like to see stop and search powers increased. I'd like mm. the police to be able to act on operational evidence without fear of you know, political mm. correctness. Um, something that we spoke about on Newspeak, but we'd like, we'd like uh, so the police to look into the causes of crime and who's committing crime without, and, and to be able to look at the types of crime that have been committed by what, what sort of groups of people, so their nationality, um, who's committing crime where and have a full and frank you know discussion about mm. that rather than as we know those statistics are often even not obtained but if they are they're buried because they're not politically correct so we'd mm. like to, to do that as well but we'd like to go into the most disadvantaged areas and attempt a kind of what's often called a broken windows approach so the idea of really cracking down on all crimes so even small crime you know graffiti and, and so on to really try and see if that will help the most disadvantaged uh, areas of london so yeah that's what we would do for for policing that's it. with the, the broken windows mm. approach as you explain um, this was something or well, pioneered i suppose by giuliani in new york wasn't it yeah and the idea was that and i think it's borne out by what happened in new york is that you know if, if there's a broken window people are more likely to break more they're more likely to steal from the building all of these it's like the small things yeah. it's like look after the pennies and the pounds will take care of themselves sort yeah. of thing, isn't it but obviously new york has now slid right back and is very violent again but for a long time in the 90s it was so safe and in fact people used to complain that it had lost its sparkle but i think the problem is i mean do you think that the mayor should even have control over the police you know he is the london commissioner isn't he effectively yeah i mean it's a good point i mean something we thought about when we were thinking about the campaign is it, do we even need well something we played with was do we even need a mayor or should one of our policies be to have a referendum on whether we should have a mayor of london and what powers he should have because he has he or she has a, such a large <laughs> such a large budget um, and, you know, this is a time where we're in a sort of cost of living crisis and people can't afford to buy housing. So we, would, we just toyed with, could we find a way of just giving as much money back to the people and, and, and having the, the mayor just have less power? So I do think there's an argument for that. But then I would also say we're at a time where people feel that there's a complete lack of authority. There's a complete lack of leadership. And that actually could be where a really positive mayor could be very useful. So I think, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to have for the mayor to have so much power. But um, I do think there, is, there can be a role for the mayor within the police and within transport, um, you know, to, to offer kind of guidance and to bring people together, which Sadiq Khan is, is not doing. Um. Um, do you think, I mean, look, you don't have to, of course, you, you'd like to win. <coughs> Excuse me, you'd like to win. Um, he, if he wins, will be a third term. Mm -hmm. What's your sense on the ground? I think there's more more people dislike Khan this year round than ever before. I think ULEZ is the big thing right. that a lot of people who may have voted Khan really are, do not like ULEZ. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, within this mayoral contest, the right is quite split, whereas the left isn't. There's not much, and it's a first past the post. It's a you know one choice on the it's voting. Changed, yes, it? so it's so you just pick one. So he is kind of the left. So I don't know how it will affect things. But I think people, but a lot of people are sick of Sadiq Khan. And, you know, people have p pointed out to me recently, a lot of his advertisement, a lot of his campaign at the moment is what he's going to do. He's not, he's not talking about what he's done because he has on so many things on housing, on crime, he's fouled. His only thing, his only claim is that he's green and he's, you know, helped with pollution, which actually arguably he hasn't because a lot, you know, there's a lot of evidence to show that the ULIS hasn't really done that. So I think it's it's a case of people really feeling like they've been let down by Sadiq Khan. Mm. And um, he doesn't seem to, I don't think he, I, when I see him in interviews, I don't even think he believes what he's saying half the time. He, he seems a bit flat, actually. Um, and it's, I think it's coming through in his campaign a bit. But, you know, obviously London is very uh, woke and left-leaning. So um, I, th I think still people will vote, a lot of people will still vote for him, unfortunately. Yes. 
I've always thought that there was sort of no chance that he wouldn't win, mm, uh, yeah. simply for that reason, that there's been a massive demographic change. People voted on cultural lines and the kind of middle class, professional, whatever, lefties would also vote for him sort of on principle, regardless of what's happening with knife crime, I know. you know, in a way. Um, but he said recently, <coughs> Khan, uh, it, well, he did one of his flash videos, it doesn't matter where you're from, everyone is a Londoner. I mean, do you agree with that? No, it doesn't, it doesn't even make sense. Does it? <laughs> well, everyone in the world is a Londoner. I mean, I think, can't, you know, we have a mayor who absolutely will not confront the impact of mass immigration on London. Um, you know, we hear diversity is our strength so often. You know, he tweets it, he puts posters up of it. Um, and we all know it's, it's a lie. And, and, you know, it's maddening just to have a, a, someone in a position of, of leadership essentially saying something that you think, well, that just doesn't cut it. That doesn't make sense. That's not what we're experiencing on the ground. On the ground, we're seeing that there's so many different cultures that don't have you know, British values um, that are often misogynistic, that are often very violent, they're often committing lots of crime. Um, and, you know, when does he ever speak out about the effect that mass immigration has had on London? You know, um, I think we need a mayor that will say, you know, London is full, that will say to mm. Westminster, look, London cannot take any more. We've got about 10 million people now in London. The ha you know, it's affecting housing, it's affecting, you know, the economy so much and crime, as I said, um, and he won't even acknowledge it. And I think so many people would just, even if he didn't bring any policies, he, even if he just acknowledged it, people would feel a kind of a relief. Oh, yeah, that's being acknowledged. Because, of course, the mayor can't have that much impact on mass immigration, but he can advocate for London and mm. say, look, we are being affected by this and this, and this is how we're being affected by it. Um, I think that's a very good point. I mean, excuse me, <clears throat> when I was standing myself in your position, what, eight years ago, Everyone kept saying to me, yes, but the mayor doesn't have power over immigration. You know, and you said, but, but that's not the point. Mm. The point is, you say, see, he can advocate for London. He can basically say, we can't, you know, this, these are the problems. Mm. So look, you know, you've got to bear that in mind. But I think actually, I mean, in my whole time there of five years um, on the assembly, um, when housing came up, when all of these came up, immigration was verboten. No one ever spoke about it. You'd have these phantom conversations. And if you did bring it up, you were immediately uh, a troublemaker or a, med or a bigot or mm. whatever. It just wasn't even brought up. I mean, it's a, one of the wokest places I think I've ever you know. It's, I know, it's extraordinary. But I do feel, I, I, I may be wrong, but I feel like that's changing a little bit because you're even seeing you know, immigrants saying there's too much immigration. You're seeing people mm. who are, are Muslim or or people who are, you know, Asian or African who've come here, first generation immigrants who are saying this is crazy, you know, we've come here because we want a good life. But if you're going to keep allowing more and more people in, mm. then none of us will benefit from it. Mm. So I don't know. I feel like I feel like the conversation around immigration, I might be wrong, but is slightly changing a bit in that you're seeing people who are more on the center talking about it, maybe yeah. center left. Yeah. But I think it's so needed, you know, as you say, it needs somebody to just talk about it and and normalise talking about it within London because, you know, all the rest of the country, you know, know it's a big issue and that's what Brexit was about. Um, exactly. Well, and also another thing is, well, you must know, in, in London, which is now the kind of Remainer city, 40% yeah. of people did vote for Brexit. Exactly. You know? Yes. So you wouldn't have any fireworks with the EU colours in it. No. People no. go on to sort of about our set here. They, they say these are the EU colours. You know, <laughs> I remember this during Brexit and saying, saying that too. But on this point, actually, of the politics of London, I know this is very broad, but the SDP, you can characterise it by saying it's to the left more on economics, to the right more on cultural issues, yes, right? Yeah. But um, how do you think that plays out in London? Or will it play out in London? Yeah, I mean, I think that the SDP have one of the strongest policies on, on mass immigration. They're stronger than reform. They want to put a complete pause on mass immigration for five years. Um, and they're very anti-diversity, equity, inclusion, you're woke. Um, I think the I, I mean, I don't know that enough people know about the SDP yet. I think we're still in the early phases of people knowing. But I think it could potentially, 
it could potentially speak to that for, that mm. Brexit 40% mm. a, actually mm. that probably wouldn't vote for maybe a Thatcherite kind of economics um, but they would be interested in something like the SDP that would feel more um, palatable to them. So yes. I would have thought actually that for many people watching, for our, our viewers as well, it, it would be quite attractive the SDP yeah. to them because or, or, or actually as well this famous red wall that you know has become such oh, a oh yes yeah you know it's not people not up there are not sort of screaming out for free market here you uh. know economics um they are i would say to the left economically to the right that would be a pretty good sort of place for the sdp isn't it as well? yeah so we have so the sdp have some councillors in leeds and we are focusing on the red wall because as you say you know, when they voted for Boris, it was there was a kind of idea that they were holding their nose a little bit, and you know, Boris wasn't one of them. But you know, they were so pro Brexit. Um, I think you know, there's a lot of evidence. I mean, Matt Goodwin's talked about this, but that the, the policies of the SDP really do suit the Red mm. Wall. You know, mm. the idea that left wing but culturally conservative, left wing economically but culturally conservative, mm. with mm. a strong stance on immigration, would appeal to a lot of people. It's just just getting it out there, you know. Yeah. Um, and how about the media? How have they kind of, um, how have they welcomed you or not, you know, our friends in the media? Yeah, not too bad. Um, as I was saying before we started the interview, I, I went to the BBC uh, you know, last week and did a, did a little interview with their... I felt a bit strange being in the BBC, but um, they, were, they were fine with me. They were, they were okay. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of, I'm surprised by how many people do know about the SDP. Um, and there's lots of uh, people in various media outlets that, that are backing us, um, whether openly or, secret, you know, or, or, or secretly, that do like us. So um, generally people see us, when people do know about us, and that's the point, when they do know, they, they, we, we seem to be mm. striking a chord with people, but it's just, you know, and we're such a small party at the moment, so that's, yeah. that's the thing. Well, I mean, the, again, the, a lot of people might not know the background of the SDP. Mm -hmm. I think maybe more of our viewers were because mm -hmm. they're more politically interested. But you know, it's people. It's it's never gone away. Actually, the SDP. No, has it? it's just no, no. been it's been bubbling away there and it's sort of come back. Yeah, it took a bit of a dip for a long time, and then William Clouston, who you've had on the show, um, sort of took it over and has revitalised it. But of course, it started. No, I think it's right in the 80s with David Owen and the, the, the Gang of Four. Um, I had the f uh, was very fortunate enough to meet David Owen, uh, the former um, foreign secretary and health mm. secretary, who's very interested in what we're doing. Um, very, very knowledgeable about politics. It was, you know, wonderful to meet him and um, very supportive of what we're doing. So there are people. When we, when I've been knocking on doors and speaking to people, you do get sort of people over the age of 40 sort of do remember the SDP yeah. and they talk about it quite fondly. They saw you, yeah, they were quite big at one point. And I remember, you know, yeah. I remember Shirley Williams and, and David Owen. So there is that still, there is still a- uh, And winning by-elections. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. In fact, at one point they were, you know, uh, if you look at smaller parties now, people say, oh God, you know, they're on 15%. With the SDP, I think for a while it was on some crazy amount. Yes, yeah, they did very well. Yeah, yeah. 30, 40 percent. Yeah, yeah. And then, of course, the part, they went and formed the Liberal Democrats and mm. that sort of took over. And then the SDP kind of um, dipped a bit. But yeah, no, still, there is still, people still do remember them. Um, you mentioned a, 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 a few minutes ago about London basically not having really gotten over the uh, pandemic. Yeah. I would agree with you on that. It, it just feels like a. Not exactly a shadow of its former self, but something has changed. Um, I wonder, also, in London, you've got this case of um, people working from home in, in a way that this simply is not the case in the rest of the country. Yeah. I mean, what is your view on that? Do you think people should almost be forced to come back <laughs> to work? You know? I think so, possibly. I mean, particularly London, where being in the public square feels so important. It's our capital city. Um, it, to me, it feels very important. I know, we, we, I mean, it feels like now Fridays feel pretty dead because I know that for often people have a, you know, work from home on Fridays now. And you do just feel like, um, yeah, the, the, the energy and the buzz isn't there anymore. And that does feel like we've really, we've really lost something. Mm. So yes, I, I would be encouraging people to, to be coming. And, and of course, if they're coming in, they're using, 
they're use, you know, they're using shops and restaurants more and getting the economy going, which is what it really needs because uh, you know it all feeds into one thing to the next. And of course, if there's no, more people out, you feel safer. Mm. And that's something I noticed during the pandemic and subsequently that when I was traveling at certain times, there was less people around. Mm. And that is a kind of a policing of itself, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and now you don't have that. And the more you don't have that, the more people won't go out. So it's like a vicious circle. So you think, well, I won't go out because there won't be many people around. And then it just becomes dead. Uh, yes, one felt sort of very exposed during the pandemic. You know, there's, I remember people saying at the time in London, anyway, because I was in London, um, that suddenly you saw all the homeless people and you also saw people who were generally mentally ill yeah. out and about far more because usually they were just by the side and then suddenly they were exposed walking mm. around the parks or whatever. Mm. Um, is this the beginning of a, a wider political career, do you think? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's very str- I'm finding the whole thing very strange. It's very interesting. I'm learning a lot and it's... Um, it's yeah, I, I just don't know. I, I, I definitely, you know, will stay with the SDP, I think. I've never yeah. been part of a political party before. Um, and it's the first time I felt something like, you know, it approximates my views more or less. Um, so we'll see. And it depends on, you know, it depends on the general election and how things go. And I think there's going to be huge political shifts, I think, in the next five to ten years. We'll probably have a Labour government. I think people will become more and more disillusioned with... Labour and Tory and how that will play for the smaller parties it's difficult to to know but it, it might well have an impact so we'll see but at the moment it's it is nice um, doing something that feels positive and you know meeting lots of people who are like-minded you often see as well with the smaller parties the people that go into it aren't so careerist in the way as they're not looking for a short way yeah. to become an MP as soon as possible. Of course, if you wanted that, you'd go for the main political parties. Yeah. I've met so many kind of talented and successful, interesting people in the SDP who really do care about politics. Mm. Um, and you sort of think, gosh, why, you know, you could, you could be an MP, but they, because they have, you know, integrity and they want to be with a party that really does express what they feel. They're with the smaller parties. So, you know, who knows? I think that is a real test, actually. I mean, mm. I remember it with within, UKIP, within uh, same thing, that you were, the reason, there was no reason to be in UKIP if you wanted professional advancement or social advancement mm. or any of this stuff mm. up the greasy pole or any of that stuff. Um, and it was down, therefore, to the strength of your conviction, yeah. which puts forward, therefore, a lot of very, very good people, also some bad people, yeah. for, you know, but I mean, <laughs> on the whole, I think, more interesting, more thoughtful people, mm. actually, on the whole, mm. I would say. Now, look, if people want to help you on the stump, I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, we've only got, what, three weeks left, I think, mm-hmm. about three mm-hmm. weeks left. What should they do? Where should they, if they want to come out, mm-hmm. campaign for you, whatever, mm-hmm. what, how do they get in touch? So you could, you could email us at info at um, sdp.co.uk, but um, we've also got... So we've got a London, get a London SDP kind of group. So we're on Twitter, and we're you know you could look us up and join us. Um, also, you could check out my manifesto at the SDP website. So just type in SDP manifesto Amy, and it should come up. Um, but definitely, or just contact me or or uh, the team directly. So so yeah. for example, where can people find you on Twitter? So I'm at Stand Up to Woke. But Stand we, Up to Woke, yeah. Isn't it? yeah. So we also have, and that's what we're calling our kind of campaign. Right. Um, but we also have there's SDP London on Twitter and the SDP Main um, uh, site on Twitter. So you could get in contact with us there. I mean, join, become a member. And um, if you become a member, you'll get regular invites to our. Um, you know, we have regular meetups in London, so you could come to that. Right. Um, we're going to be setting up some stalls and doing some leafleting pretty soon. So if you join and you want to help out, then just let us know. And also, are you in the, this booklet that they do? Yes, the mail? yes. This yes. is a thing. It's, it's, it's really quite important because it goes to every household, doesn't I know. it? This yeah. is the mail booklet. Yeah, yeah. So has that gone out yet? Or? It's gone out. Yeah, it has gone out. I, I haven't physically seen it yet, but I have been sent photos of it to see that it's right. gone out. It's very strange to think that my photo's in... Four million homes. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is exactly. But um, yeah, so it's yeah. I guess you know people will find out about us there as well. Um, so yeah. Okay. Well, look, 
Um, obviously, you know, wish you all the very, very best, Naomi. And we've just got a, a couple of questions for our members, special members, to ask you. But um, in the meantime, thanks very much for joining us. And the very best for May the 2nd. Thank you, Peter. And see you on Newspeak. <laughs> yes. Um, that's it for the show this week. Um, do have a good week, won't you? And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.